Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm Jessica Matthews, president of the Carnegie Endowment. It's my great pleasure to uh, welcome you this morning um, and to welcome our distinguished guest speaker, Nasser Judah, the foreign minister of the Kingdom of Jordan. Um, a year and a half after the beginning of the uh, demonstrations in the Arab world in Tunisia, um, what we do know is that we have seen only the very beginning of a profound and very long-term transformation that is underway. Uh, from the very beginning, uh, Carnegie scholars have avoided using the word Arab Spring in favor of Arab Awakening because of our conviction, um, shared by Jordan's King Abdullah in a speech he gave to the European Parliament a few weeks ago, when he said these events will not be over in a season, not even a year, um, and as I think he would probably agree, uh, probably more like decades. Um, it's going to be the work of a generation, uh, at least, to build a new order in the Middle East, um, and one on which we hope will be built on participatory governance, respect for the rights of others, tolerance, and pluralism. As that process unfolds, Jordan finds itself at the heart of, uh, of a cauldron. To the north, there is the conflict in Syria that's already claimed 10 or 15,000 lives and shows, uh, far from signs of abating, shows signs of intensification. To the east, Iraq's fragile political balance is once again threatening to come apart. To the south, Sunni monarchies in Saudi Arabia and Bahrain are engaging, are struggling to respond to the forces of change that are sweeping the region. And to the West, the Israeli-Palestinian peace process remains as intractable as ever. From a distance, uh, these challenges are daunting and difficult and uh, for our and for the international community, but for Jordan, they are the daily fact of life um, unfolding on its borders. So um, Jordan has, I think, a unique perspective um, on, the, on these events, and so we are very pleased and lucky to have with us uh, the foreign minister to, uh, to share his assessment. Um, before assuming his current position, uh, Nasser Judah was... Uh, in, in 2009, uh, Nasser Judah served as the Jordanian government's official spokesman and minister for media and communications, and uh, we've just been enjoying a conversation about the new world of media and communications um, as we shared a cup of coffee, and um, uh, as he pointed out, everybody now has their own press conference, their own television show, um, and their own um, uh, their own, all their own media channels uh, at an individual level. It's changing things in a, in a kind of a big way. Uh, the foreign minister is a seasoned veteran also of the Middle East peace process uh, and of the, the scene in general. He's played an important role in efforts to bring Israelis and Palestinians back to the peace table to, so that um, uh, there's a great deal, in fact, most of what's happening in the region that he can speak to um, in, in a, a with first-hand knowledge. So we're delighted to, to welcome him here to Carnegie to discuss the challenges and opportunities that are facing the Arab world um, and, uh, and to engage in a Q&A with you afterwards. So please join me in welcoming Foreign Minister of Jordan, uh, Nasser Jew. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jessica. It's a um, great uh, pleasure to be here. And thank you all for um, inviting me and for being here, and for what you're about to put up with in terms of listening to me. Uh, but I um, just want to say that um, it's a real pleasure and privilege uh, to be here with you and um, Catherine, of course, and everybody. Um, and I can't help but agree with the premise that you started with, which is um, we, we do refer to what's been happening um, in the Arab world over the last uh, 13, 14 months as Arab, the Arab awakening or a series of Arab awakenings yes. um, because uh, the common denominators are very few in some, um, in some cases. So um, uh, it is, at the end of the day, 
and um, Arab awakening that has translated itself into several Arab awakenings in different, in different um, countries. So um, allow me at the beginning to say what a, what a great uh, uh, honor it is um, uh, for me to be here, and um, it is always useful to have the opportunity to exchange uh, views and ideas about the Middle East, particularly with distinguished thinkers and scholars, such as those here at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Um, never has such a dialogue um, been more valuable than it is today, when the region is in the midst of unprecedented change. And as you said, His Majesty the King's position is that we have only seen the beginning and that it is up to leaders to uh, react and interact with the, uh, the need for change and with the events that have taken place in order to um, ensure that future generations benefit from this gateway to dignity, one would uh, um, hasten to say. Um, two years ago, None of us, no think tank, no scholar, definitely no politician, um, <laughs> could have imagined the extent of, uh, extent of change that has taken place in the Arab world in such a short period. Um, I keep um, uh, referring to um, a panel discussion that I took part in um, on the margins of the World Economic Forum in, in Jordan in October 2011, and the title of the session was Geostrategic uh, scenarios for 2012. And I walked in, and Tony Blair was there, and Amr Musa, and, and I said, you know, forget this title, because had we been sitting here in October 2010, none of us could have predicted what was going to happen in 2011. So it's better to talk about today and how we can build on, on today rather than try and, and predict what's going to happen uh, next year. The dynamics of change are in motion, um, and there's no way to, to stop them. So change... Um, has taken place, change is taking place, and we all knew that the situation um, in many Arab countries was unsustainable and that change was and is inevitable. But the magnitude and speed of the change that has occurred uh, exceeded even the bravest of predictions. Things have changed um, quickly, um, and like I said, it was not totally unexpected. Um, the events of the last 18 months are obviously um, the result of reaching a tipping point on a course that was set in motion nearly two decades ago. What set this change in motion was probably the rise of two concomitant phenomena. The first of these phenomena um, was the expansion in the field of higher education in the Arab, uh, in the Arab world. Um, with higher qualifications came higher hopes and expectations and the quest for better and equal opportunity. And the second was the global revolution in information um, and communication technology, um, social uh, media, um, the ability to interact with the rest of the world in an instant. Uh, people in our part of the world, and we keep reminding the world that the majority are the youth. In every country in the Arab world, I think you will see facts and figures that point to the fact that 70% 75% um, of the population is under a certain age. So you um, in, invest in education, whether it's um, uh, primary, secondary, um, or university, higher education, and then in many uh, countries you leave the youth um, in, in a situation where they don't have jobs, high unemployment, they're not empowered, they're not able to participate in the shaping of their own futures and, and, and destiny, and they're certainly not, not even remotely close to taking part in the politics of their own country. So together, I mean, these um, two factors, and of course being aware through information communication technology, um, fueled uh, these uh, grievances, and the, the two of them uh, put together, I think, provided the elements of the perfect storm. Um, and that's why you, um, you saw what we have all seen in the last um, 13, 14 months, and we'll probably continue to see in many countries. Again, um, social media has enabled the youth of our part of the world uh, to experience um, and be exposed to firsthand participatory politics, meritocracy, opportunity, and dignity in other countries around the world. And I think social media has presented itself as a potent tool, an effective and efficient means of political and social mobilization. And we saw that very, very clearly in Egypt in particular, not to mention other countries. 
no longer could the security apparatuses in the countries of the Arab Spring prevent or even contain or curb the sharing of news, ideas, or more importantly, calls for action. And the evolution of society was confronted by the political uh, reality. The reality was not merely stale and stagnant. Worse, it was regressing. Instead of incrementally expanding the participatory base for power, as was the evolution of the franchise in much of the developed world, the Arab world was shrinking it. The base of power was devolving from the single party to cliques within the party, or often, and worse, from a single party to groups from the same town, sect, village, or tribe. Some Arab countries had given the world its first term experiment with monarchical republics, um, where power is inherited and shared only by the few who um, control the scene or who run the show or impose their will on the many. Needless to say, with this regression from bad to worse came the end of opportunity and the end of dignity and perhaps the end of hope for betterment. This despair manifested itself most pronouncedly in the lack of economic advancement and ability to attain financial affluence for those outside the narrow and limited circles of power. With this concentration of power in few and fewer hands, already weak checks and balances were now shattered. And what little transparency and accountability there was vanished completely. The inevitable outcome was corruption on a scale never before seen or imagined, and just as importantly, a public perception that held corruption to be the source of all economic woes and economic hardship. So fueled by higher education, enhanced by information technology, and driven by the quest for dignity, change was on its way long before the events of the Arab Spring or the Arab Awakening. The question was what form it will take. Ultimately, the form of change was and continues to be determined by the ability of the political systems to respond to and be ahead of mobilized public opinion. In countries with systems that confused the resolve with stubbornness, the gales of the Arab Spring swept away what stood in its path. However, in others, I'd like to uh, say my country included, Jordan, where this inevitability of change has long been recognized, the breeze of the Arab Spring breathed new life into a reform process that needed new impetus to move forward. So it was a gentle breeze that came to a system that was already on its um, um, way towards um, a, a future that was brighter. Distinguished friends, aside from the fact that there has been a long-held belief in Jordan by the leadership, by His Majesty the King, of the inevitability of change, there are other factors that make the Jordanian situation unique. These components of increased higher education, improved information communication technology, and the shrinking power base were either not present or were of an entirely different nature in Jordan. I'm sure some will find this difficult to accept, so allow me to expand on this point in more detail. Jordan was an early investor in, in education. This translated into an education boom that occurred much earlier in Jordan than many other um, Arab countries. This created opportunities both inside and outside Jordan that come with such levels of education. In addition, Jordan by and large, and in particular when compared, compared to um, certain neighbors, has always been a country open to most forms of ideas and ideologies. By virtue of, of this, Jordanians have always been aware of and exposed to global values, practices, and principles. And these values and principles which were not totally absent from the country's political life. This openness made the boom in information technology a positive tool rather than a threat to the system. In certain countries, they were prohibited and often um, oppressed. Most importantly, there was no contraction in the power base, no concentration of decision-making and wealth in a chosen few or party or group. No doubt there are many imperfections and deficiencies in Jordanian politics that 
require reform and improvement. But the system remains proactive, functional, credible, and most importantly, the political system was always in close touch with the people of Jordan and was thus fully aware of the socio-economic and political dynamics that occurred in society. No barriers. Contact is always uh, there. And so, like I said, fully aware of the socio-economic and political dynamics that occurred in society and is fully cognizant of the legitimate grievances that exist. The king and the political system at large had a complete understanding of the state of affairs at home and in the region, as well as of the challenges ahead. And accordingly, Jordan had always had a reform process at any given moment in time, be it political, economic, social, or administrative. Dear friends and colleagues, the advent of Arab awakening or Arab awakenings gave Jordan, under the king, the opportunity that um, he had awaited to jumpstart reforms again. And I will get into that, I'm sure, with the uh, questions and, and answers. Some people will say, when did the reform process actually start? Why was it delayed? Why did it suffer from so many setbacks? Why did it take so, so many hits? And um, you know, I'll just say very briefly here that it's um, easier said than done when you're embarking on political and economic reforms and having to deal with three wars in the region at the same time, or in a country like Jordan, having to deal with rising um, prices of, uh, of oil or be totally reliant on the Egyptian gas pipeline and then be required to put in, and I see Dr. Sultan Lutfi in the back, so I hope he doesn't um, uh, check me on my economics, but um, all I want to say is that um, um, at least um, the, the progress of reform is in, a, in the form of a steady pace forward. Um, because of Jordan's geostrategic position and because of uh, some of the uh, events that are beyond our control, sometimes, as the king said, two steps forward, one step back, but at least it's heading in the right direction. So let me, um, um, let me reiterate again that uh, the Arab Spring has allowed Jordan again, um, allowed the king, to jumpstart um, uh, reforms, come what may, in spite of all that's happening in the region, especially on the political front. And accordingly, um, the king instantly um, expedited the reform agenda, taking advantage of this new momentum. And let us not um, be in denial. Um, while Jordan is uh, different, while the reform process in Jordan had begun before the Arab awakenings, uh, the general mood of the Arab Spring has affected all the country. And so when it came to, uh, to Jordan, because of um, a process that had already been undertaken, um, I think the, um, the, the equation was more balanced. The pivotal and most challenging um, aspect in, in the process of political reform is to have clarity of vision with regards to the form um, and shape of the country in the post-reform era. Jordan has overcome this obstacle. The king led the, consen led the consensus in identifying the ultimate game for political reforms and clearly articulated through an, an unequivocal commitment to the formation of govern governments and designation of prime ministers uh, by the king from the party or coalition that has a majority in the House of Representatives in Parliament. Of course, this must be within a fr framework that is inclusive and in which there are appropriate checks and balances. To reach this end, an all-encompassing national dialogue was established and was tasked with producing recommendations and guidelines for new legislation to govern elections and promote political parties. These guidelines for uh, the leg legislation required to govern elections and um, uh, promote political uh, parties will stem from the aim at producing a more represented and more represented representative and better functioning parliament and at galvanizing and empowering political parties in a way that would allow for true parliamentary democracy. The goal is to have the requisite laws, all the requisite laws in place uh, by this summer and the elections before the end of this year. There will be challenges and the result may be far from um, ideal. But then again, we cannot underestimate the importance of having a clear and articulated goal. And we do. And the elections will bring us one step closer. Dear friends, the first step in this process of establishing a new framework 
for parliamentary democracy has not only been put in motion, it has been completed. Specifically, I speak of the review, comprehensive review, of our uh, constitution that took place last year. As, as you know, Jordan's constitution was drafted in its modern contemporary form in 1952. And between 1954 and 1984, we had 29 amendments uh, to this constitution. And last year, some of the demonstrations that were taking place, place were by some opposition groups were calling for a review of the amendments to the 1952 Constitution. And when we say the king was ahead of the curve, people sometimes say, well, this is a cliche. What do you mean by that? And um, I give them this example. When the opposition was asking for a review of the 29 amendments, the king came and said, no, we would like to review the entire Constitution, um, the entire document. And as a result, the Royal Commission that was established um, by the king um, ended up submitting recommendations for, um, a, um, uh, for amendments to 42 articles out of a 130 article constitution. So um, you're talking about a third of the Jordanian constitution and that was what was ratified by parliament um, uh, later. So um, in, in that respect, and many of these amendments had to do with the redefinition of the powers of the, uh, of the king and the, the separation between the different branches of the, uh, of the state and the checks and balances that are uh, required. So the emerging consensus um, in Jordan was that this was a milestone in terms of the constitutional amendments. And um, um, as a result, um, the um, constitution is now um, um, in, its, um, in its new format. Um, heralding a new beginning for, uh, for Jordan, a new political um, uh, reality on the ground. But the constitutional amendments not only were comprehensive and substantive, they centered on a few fundamental um, areas. First, guaranteeing and enhancing the freedoms, rights, and liberties of Jordanians. Second, establishing a constitutional court uh, that is entrusted with safeguarding the constitution and ensuring that legislation and decisions are in conformity with the Constitution. Third, establishing an independent elections commission that will not only oversee, but it will manage and conduct and administer parliamentary elections and ensure the credibility and integrity and transparency and fairness of these elections. And by the way, I think this is probably one of its kind in our region, an independent election commission that is totally independent from uh, the government, from parliament, uh, from the judiciary, in fact, it is the, the body that will set the dates for the election, and it is involved already in the pre-registration, registration of voters, and then at the end of the day, the conduction of the, of the, election them, the elections themselves. And the fourth um, area would be to restore the balance between the executive authority and the legislative authority through making the absence of parliament for more than four months almost an impossibility, coupled with eliminating the government's discretion to pass provisional laws, temporary laws. This is a major, major undertaking and a major achievement. Um, no more um, temporary laws in the absence of uh, parliament, except in three specific cases, war, natural disaster, or the need to disperse aid urgent funds. Apart from that, no temporary laws from now on. The independent um, electoral uh, commission has now assumed its responsibilities and has begun preparations for the upcoming elections. The legislation for the Constitutional Court just came into force a few days ago. The political parties law was enacted and the elections law will be passed and enacted in the very, very near future. It is in its final stages of debate in the Parliament. In this context, I must point to the fact that election laws are always, and I'm preempting some of the questions that I'm probably going to receive, but election laws are always controversial and a full-fledged consensus around them is almost an impossibility given the fact that any change will produce winners as well as losers. Parliament has been conducting consultations with stakeholders and civil society over the past few weeks since the draft law was submitted. And we'll be debating uh, the draft bill, um, is debating it actually as we speak, and we'll be finalizing in the next few days. And we hope that the law that will emerge will be inclusive and representative um, if we want our efforts to succeed. These foundations, but I mean, maybe on the, on the elections law, I would um, just as, a, as an anecdote say that um, we have had several attempts at election uh, laws. 
And we, um, uh, we had the 1989 election law, for example, that produced um, a, a very vibrant parliament um, at the time, uh, according to a one-person multiple vote system. Um, and in 1993, we changed that to one person, one vote. In 2010, we had one person, um, two votes, uh, one person, one vote in a virtual district. And now the draft law that's in Parliament uh, today is one person, three votes, two plus one, two for the district, one for a national uh, list. In, uh, like I said earlier, um, election laws, electoral laws will always be controversial, and you will never find an electoral law that pleases everyone. Uh, I use, I apply what I'm about to say to the Middle East peace process, and I always say that you're never going to find a solution to the Arab-Israeli conflict uh, that leaves everybody equally happy, because people have to make compromises, they have to make concessions. What you're looking for is a solution that leaves everybody equally unhappy. <laughs> so, and that, that, that same notion applies to electoral law. So long as the process is transparent, so long as the process is fair, so long as the elections are representative, and so long as the end result is a truly representative parliament, then uh, the conscience should be clear. So um, I would say here that the foundations for parliamentary governments in Jordan have been laid, and skeptical or pessimistic voices that emerge tend to focus on a particular element and overlook the full picture and the accomplish accomplishments on the ground. Jordan has come a long way in the past few months. And progress is still underway. Uh, inevitably, there are delays, but they are measured in weeks, uh, not in years. And they are largely due to procedural bureaucracy. For those, and I'm not trying to sound um, uh, defensive or anything, I'm just stating facts as they are. But they are measured again um, in, in weeks. And for those who want to evaluate uh, progress, this evaluation should be based on the advancements reached towards the defined goal. And for those who want to be skeptical, their skepticism should be based on our alteration of the defined goal or steering away from the, from the path that we have set for ourselves. And on the facts on the ground, show, the facts on the ground show nothing of the sort for either group. They show the, uh, the opposite. And I think that um, it is very, very important when engaging uh, Jordan, when one wants to um, analyze um, the, uh, the discourse in Jordan or where Jordan is heading in terms of the political, economic, and social reforms, to engage everyone in order to get an insight or to get some uh, elements of, of, of analysis, to try and talk not just to the vocal far right and the vocal far left, but to the critical mass in the middle, which happens to be the center. And the, this is a vibrant, a vibrant center in Jordan, and it's in the, in the process of reforming and redefining um, itself. And it is sometimes, um, I see from uh, people who visit the country or are interested in, in Jordan, that the first port of call is usually the far right or the far left, because they make the loudest, the loudest noise, and they have every right to be heard, and they have every right uh, to be part of the national discourse and the national uh, uh, debate uh, on this. And sometimes uh, they do enrich the, um, the, the conversation and enrich the process, but they are not the, uh, the, the only ones. And you, you tend to see a lot of skepticism sometimes um, by, by people who are completely detached from uh, Jordan or by people who have been um, involved in attempting um, or taking a shot at uh, uh, trying to produce an, an electoral law, as happened with the national um, agenda, for example, in the, in the past, where consensus was reached on everything except the elections law uh, because of the uh, absence of engagement, proper engagement, between civil society and, um, uh, and the government at the time and the uh, legislature. Um, again, uh, I would say that the smoothest of transitions will have um, its ups and downs, uh, pauses and accelerations, as well as uh, evaluations and examinations. Jordan is no different, and despite the obstacles we confront, we remain steadfast in heading towards our defined goal. And we make missteps sometimes, um, as in any process, but we are the first to identify the, the misstep and to bring it back in, uh, in line. Um, at the end of the day, we've had, um, we've had um, uh, our um, version of uh, uh, the awakening or the Arab uh, Spring, that has been change without chaos, change that was led from the top, no violence. Um, by and large, when you see protests in Jordan, and protests are not a new thing in, in Jordan. Deep-rooted in history, I think it's, a established, it's an established culture and tradition to have Jordanians protest and, um, and submit um, and, and to present their um, opinions and criticism to the government um, uh, freely. But the, the, this is taking place without, uh, without earth-shattering violence 
without fatalities, without people being shot. Um, and we, we don't do this sort of thing in Jordan. Um, and, and the most important thing is that in any demonstration that you see on the street, um, there will, that will not happen in the absence of a dialogue. Um, and you will see that those who are in, in, the, in the street, mainly on an economic platform, mind you, uh, will have representatives talking to the government inside. So it's a, it's a parallel track. I'm sorry if I'm speaking too long. I'll need another four or five minutes just to address other um, issues, if I may. I would um, say that this Arab Spring or the series of Arab reawakenings that I referred to earlier should not make us lose focus on a core uh, problem and challenge in the Middle East. Come what may, regardless of the events of our part of the world, the Palestinian problem. Um, and this problem is not removed or detached from the current upheavals in the Arab world. Arabs who uh, took to the street across the entire spectrum of the Arab world to uphold the values of freedom, dignity, equality, human rights, justice, and equal opportunity will and are already demanding the same for the Palestinian people. The Arabs will calibrate their dealings with, the, with Israel on the basis of justice being done to the Palestinians as well as freedom, dignity, and equality through enabling them to have their own sovereign, independent state. Um, and uh, this has got to happen uh, soon and according to the parameters that we all know, international legitimacy um, and the uh, points of reference to the peace process as well as the Arab Peace Initiative. For Jordan, it is important to have this two-state two solution. For Jordan, it is important to have peace and security in the Middle East. And the two-state two state solution means an independent, viable, contiguous Palestinian state and security for Israel, and by extension, security for the whole, uh, for the whole region. Um, it is, again, of primordial interest uh, for Jordan. It is something that I will repeat when I say that the establishment of the independent Palestinian state is as much a national interest for Jordan as it is for the Palestinians um, themselves, and as it is perhaps for many countries around the world. And I keep saying um, peace in the Middle East is peace of mind for the rest of the world, because this is not a local or regional conflict. This is a global conflict with global ramifications, and everybody knows that. And the resolution of this um, conflict also affects our domestic dynamics, including the pace and scope of reform. We are major players and the most affected stakeholders in um, and by core issues such as refugees, Jerusalem, water, borders, and security. So we're not when we... Um, the reference was made to uh, my personal involvement in, um, at the beginning of, uh, uh, of the year with the Palestinian-Israeli negotiators, but I remind them all the time that we are not just a mediator or an honest broker. We are a stakeholder, and it is very much in our interest and according to our national uh, security concerns that we uh, do this. So on the basis of our deep conviction and full understanding that uh, stagnation and stalemate on the front of the Palestinian-Israeli peacemaking would give the upper hand to the radicals in the new emerging um, orders in the Arab world and the chance to shape this new emergent order. And because we are um, in our own right um, stakeholders, as I mentioned earlier, in resolving this Palestinian-Israeli conflict peacefully and through direct negotiation. So I think you all know the obvious. I don't need to uh, repeat it, but we began a modest um, effort in Jordan at the beginning of this year. Um, His Majesty the King felt that the stalemate, the absence of face-to-face -face discussion for over 16 months was not only not helpful, but extremely da dangerous and um, quite, um, um, quite um, um, and is of quite serious concern to us, especially given the mood of, um, of the Arab world uh, at the time and the uh, preoccupation of many countries uh, with their internal uh, affairs. So we brought the Palestinian and, and the Israelis to Jordan in what we describe as exploratory talks. And there's never uh, any shortage of creativity in our part of the world. Um, uh, they're sometimes referred to as direct negotiations or indirect negotiations or proximity talks or by proxy or, you know, and we wanted to join the club and call them exploratory talks. And, 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 it, and it worked. And I'm sorry, I'm being cynical, but um, <laughs> it, it worked in the sense that it provided the negotiators with um, a, a positive atmosphere. And perhaps as a result, we had a conducive environment that led to the continuation of contacts between the two sides and led to a positive exchange of letters between um, President Abbas and Prime Minister uh, Netanyahu. And I think now we're in, all in, in wait and see mode uh, to see if that positive atmosphere and if that um, 
um, useful exercise that took place in Jordan at the beginning of this year will result in the resumption of direct negotiations. We have something very solid to fall back on, which is uh, the quartet statement of uh, September 2011, which for the first time set a timeline, uh, put timelines on the issues, 30 days to, to have um, a preparatory meeting, 90 days to exchange comprehensive proposals on borders and security, 180 days to achieve progress, and a framework agreement by the end of 2012. This is, well, we're halfway through 2012, and we um, bickered for uh, many weeks as to when the uh, 90 days uh, kicked in. Was it um, the Israeli interpretation of the 26th of uh, October or the Palestinian, I'm sorry, the Palestinian uh, 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 26th of October or the Israeli interpretation, which is 3rd of January? Um, but I think that with a conflict that has gone on for um, many decades, uh, a week or two are not going to make um, um, a difference if there is a process um, in motion. And we always try to avoid the word process because there's been, as King Abdullah II of Jordan says, there's been too much process and not enough peace. Um, and sometimes we, we have processes for the sake of processes, but um, um, to have a substantive, substantial uh, process is extremely important. Everything is interconnected in our region. And um, inherently, uh, all these issues are um, uh, in the region are self-contained, um, are not ones that are self-contained, and almost have a spillover effect, if not the entire, uh, to the entire region, other parts of the world, and certainly to some parts of the region. We are closely monitoring uh, the developing situation in Egypt. Um, we are really bracing ourselves for the period before the uh, elections. There are different dynamics in place, as you all know, and I don't want to say anything. This is an on-the-record on the session to preempt what's happening in Egypt. But, of course, uh, Egypt is a very, very important um, uh, country, the most populous Arab country, and um, um, it, it is of concern to, uh, to all of us that this democratic process uh, uh, bears fruit um, in the very, very near future. We are, of course, um, and I'm not saying anything in, in a particular order, but uh, we're concerned about um, Iran's interference in the affairs of the, of the Gulf Arab uh, uh, countries, and we're concerned about this continuing um, nuclear uh, file, and we're hoping that this third round of discussion between the P5 plus 1 and Iran that will take place in Moscow next week will um, really show seriousness of intent um, and produce um, results as we do believe that the diplomatic solution um, uh, to, this, um, to this file is all um, important. We are, in Jordan, we are pursuing nuclear energy for peaceful purposes because we have an energy bill that's breaking our back. And, um, uh, and there's no natural resources uh, to speak of, and we import 96% of our um, energy requirements. So uh, when we embark on a, a nuclear uh, energy program for peaceful purposes, it is because we need that. That's a question of uh, uh, survival. But we make sure that, uh, and we're trying to make sure that we are a, a model um, in, in that sense by having it um, according to international standards and um, under um, all our um, uh, commitments to uh, IAEA and uh, NPT. And we are always calling, when it comes to military nuclear programs, for a Middle East free of nuclear weapons and weapons of mass destruction. That's been our position. Um, and we have maintained it um, uh, all along. Syria, we're all hearing the news, and we're seeing the headlines, and we're seeing the killing um, continuing, and we're uh, seeing the violence, and we're seeing that there's only um, one game in town at this stage, which is the Kofi Annan plan. He's a joint special envoy of the Arab League and the United Nations, and his plan um, comprises six points. And so far, we have seen emphasis on one point and one point um, um, only, or one component of the plan, which is the end of violence, important as it is, and the monitored. But there's a political component that needs to kick in in order uh, for all of us to pursue the political solution that we all seek uh, for Syria, so that Syria does not slide um, into a, situ a situation of um, chaos and, and anarchy. We are a neighboring um, uh, country, and we are concerned um, over what's happening in Syria. But... You know, we are, we are waiting to see if there's any new traction um, in the Kofi Annan uh, plan in the next uh, few days. And we keep saying that it's important to engage everyone, to have a process that's all-inclusive, including the Russians and the Chinese, because at the end of the day, this is um, a question that concerns um, all of us. 
We today host about 122,000 Syrians um, in Jordan. Um, 105,000 of them crossed the border um, in, the last, um, in the last 12 months without a visa requirement because there are no visa requirements between Jordan and Syria. And about 15 or 16,000 crossed the fence, running away from horrific situations where they're being shot at, seeking shelter, um, medical assistance, um, or uh, food and water. And uh, the total, like I said, today in Jordan is about 122,000. Um, pulling into an already uh, strained uh, economy, but Jordan has always been a haven, and we welcome them, and we share with them what little we have. Um, but that's not to say that it's not taking a, a toll on what I described as an already strained economy. We will continue to support a political solution uh, to the crisis in, in Syria. And we continue to say that um, Syria, again, is a geostrategically important um, uh, country, and it shouldn't be a battleground for uh, influence by um, anyone from outside the region. I wish to conclude by stating that political reforms uh, can only evolve in a healthy way, in a conducive and enabling economic and fiscal atmosphere. Jordan is determined to press on with comprehensive reforms on the political as well as the economic and social fronts. And I must stress that we are facing major challenges. I described some of them um, earlier on the economic and fiscal fronts due to the sharp rise in energy prices. I mean, I just want to give you two examples, very quick examples. Um, price of uh, a barrel of uh, oil rose by $50 between September 2010 and April, March or April 2011, if I remember correctly. A $50 um, increase at a cost uh, to an uh, extra burden on the Jordanian economy of about $25 million per $1 increase per year. So 25 million times 50, um, you do the math. In the same year, um, we um, had to suffer from one, 14 interruptions to the uh, Egyptian gas uh, supply, totaling about 144 days of interruption at a cost of $5 million a day for Jordan. So between that and this, um, we had a pretty bad year in 2011, energy-wise. Um, and I think uh, this is what keeps us up at, uh, at night how to tackle our energy requirements, how to ensure that um, our political and economic reform plans are not affected um, by that. But we are uh, committed to um, continuing with our, um, with our reforms. We are committed to being an example um, of what a, a solid, steady-paced reform process uh, is like. And we are blessed, uh, once again, that um, we have a, a leadership, a king, who is not only spearheading reform, but doing it in, in such a way as to ensure that Jordan not only becomes the example uh, of everything that is good about the Arab Spring, but uh, that Jordan uh, always looks inwards as well as outwards. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so I guess you're all probably familiar with our rules here. I'm Catherine Wilkins, the Deputy Director of the Middle East Program, and our, our Vice President, uh, Marwan Moasher, was unfortunately not able to join us today. Did he do that on purpose? He's, uh, he's in Egypt overseeing the uh, Carter um, no, he told election me. monitoring mission for the Egyptian election. So he's doing his own political reform efforts. Today. Can we have a live feed uh, yeah, from... Okay. So um, I don't know if I should begin. And then uh, there are several mics around the room. And uh, people will bring, if you raise your hand and you're um, called upon, the mic will be brought to you to ask a, a brief question and, uh, and then uh, give the mic back. <laughs> so I think perhaps since you were um, kind enough to begin with the issue of political reform, which is obviously the, one of the issues of the day, I'm wondering if you could uh, share with us what do you think is the most critical aspect of the reform process underway that will help to develop robust political parties in Jordan? Um, because right now, much of your reform, as I take it from your remarks, is sort of top-down reform. It's, it's led by the king. It's encouraged by the king. But at a certain point, to have reform, it has to be bottom-up reform. And I'm wondering if you could just comment on that. Of course. Well, I mean, I thank you for the question. Um, when we say it's led from the top, it doesn't mean that it just stays at the top. I mean, this is led by the top, but it certainly filters across uh, the entire uh, spectrum of our, uh, of our society, the entire uh, mosaic. You touch on something that's very, very important, which is political parties and the political parties' culture. 
Um, and I think you know, we're caught between a rock and a hard place because on the one hand, you want to nurture a culture of political uh, uh, parties. And on the other hand, if you're going to wait for that to happen, then you're going to be accused of delaying um, the, 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 the process. So I don't think that one is dependent on the other. I don't think it's a, it's a sequential thing. It can be a concurrent thing. Um, people have traditionally, and we were in conversation yesterday about this at the State Department, people have traditionally and historically in Jordan steered clear of, of political party activism because of the of the remnants of the 50s and the 60s. I mean, the 50s and 60s, if you were a member of a political party, you're either a communist or a Baathist, and, and subsequently a Nasserite. I mean, so, um, I mean, my, my parents' generation um, stayed away from, from political parties because, like I said, particularly in the 50s, you're either a Baathist or a communist. Um, and I think we're trying to um, re-establish that culture and really, you know, breathe new life into it. Because, again, when you're talking about 70% of the country being under 30, um, highly educated, um, highly motivated, extremely politically aware. Um, you want them to, uh, to be involved in political parties. You want them to set up political parties. We hope that this new political parties law that has just been passed will encourage the youth to form their own parties. We don't want, of course, but it's up to the people, but if you ask me, we don't want to see political parties that are just um, political. In other words, you know, they have a platform that, um, that, that is either related to the Arab-Israeli conflict or to regional politics or to the politics of the domestic scene. But no political parties, as His Majesty the King says, you know, when you talk to the youth, they're very opinionated on the Arab-Israeli conflict. They're very opinionated on what's happening in Syria, extremely opinionated about the regional politics. But you have to uh, ensure that they have um, clear views on, on, on the economy, on health, on education, on tax reform, on, um, and, and it's very, very important that you nurture that culture without being patronized. I mean, you know, you, clear you, views and political parties don't always go together, <laughs> but anyway. Well, <laughs> okay. But um, uh, it's happening. Um, I think it's happening. It's, uh, it's underway. And like I said, in Jordan today, you've got many political parties. Not that you don't have them. Uh, it's just trying to rebrand them and redefine them. Um, and, and inject new life um, uh, into them. You have the largest party in Jordan today, and the most organized is the Islamic Action Front. Um, and by the way, you know, I, I get hit with a, a lot of questions when I'm traveling. Is that, what do you think, what, what about Islam, Islamist participation in the, in the politics of Jordan? And I keep telling them, you know, I don't know about other countries, but in Jordan, the Muslim Brotherhood and the political arm of the Muslim Brotherhood, which is the IAF, um, has been part of the system, part of the political system for many, many years. The Muslim Brotherhood as a social organization um, has existed in Jordan since the mid-40s. The IAF as a political party um, for more than two decades, it contested the elections of, uh, in the elections of 1989. They had um, a 22-seat block in that parliament, plus affiliates. Uh, they had the speakership of the lower house at the time, and they had five cabinet portfolios. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's not a new thing in Jordan. I mean, maybe a, a new thing in other countries, but it's not a new thing in, uh, in Jordan. And at the same time, just because the IAF is the largest party and the most organized in Jordan, it doesn't mean that the remaining 29 or 30 odd parties that we have, which admittedly have no clear political, uh, by and large, no clear political uh, programs, doesn't mean that they're not given a fair chance just because they're not um, the, the most organized or the, or, or, the, or the oldest. So we want a political parties law and an elections law that reflects all these realities and that gives a fair chance to everybody. Mm -hmm. We'll start with Ode. You can stand uh, here and introduce yourself. Mr. Minister, welcome back to Washington. Thanks, Ode. You have given us an eloquent presentation of the challenges, the economic, the political, the social. But... <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> and in the end, you said something which is very, you know, logical. These crises interact with each other. In view of the fact that they interact with each other, and the time horizon, in my view, is short, are you optimistic or pessimistic? <laughs> On the overall picture? Yeah. Um, you know the definition of a pessimist? Mm -hmm. A well-informed optimist. <laughs> so <clears throat> I'm neither, neither this nor that, and I try to, um, uh, to, to avoid saying if I'm an optimist or 
a pessimist, even when it comes to certain specific situations. All I can tell you is I'm very optimistic about Jordan. Um, I mean, I don't know about the overall um, um, picture, and we have yet to see. I mean, there are some people who say, well, you know, the first um, clear success of, uh, of the Arab Spring has been Tunisia. And Tunisia is a, is a success story, and I hope that it is heading in the right direction. But I think the big test will be in Egypt and in other, uh, and in other countries. And Egypt is an important, um, imp all-important um, uh, country. Am I, um, um, am I hopeful that uh, this uh, Arab Spring, this is our declared position in Jordan, that the Arab Spring... Um, first of all, as, as we all said in the introduction and in, in, in my modest intervention, that it's, it's not the end. I don't think we're even halfway through. Um, I think the search for dignity um, is, is the right of uh, not just the youth but any population. So I think that uh, change has come, change is coming. You're either, um, you either resist it and suffer the consequences um, or you interact with it or you try to preempt it and lead it. And that's positive. When I say preempted, I don't mean that in the negative sense. So I, I'm, I'm very hopeful that the model that we're setting in, in Jordan, the example that we're setting in, in Jordan, the change without chaos, again, as my good friend um, Lady Ashton of the EU described it, um, the um, reform that is led from the top, the confident uh, strides, the ability to have the, not only the confidence but the courage and the boldness to say, well, I want to do this even if it means um, redefining my own role as a monarch, for example, um, or redefining uh, the, the, the system of government or redefining the system of representation. But the end result is clear, and that is to have a representative government. And we can be um, a, a model. We can be a monarchy that has a parliamentary democracy and a model in the region. So. Um, I think over here, uh, Dr. Asali, did you say... Minister, it's good to see you again. Good to see you, Ziad. I uh, hope your visit has been good and yet to get better. Okay. Uh, uh, I, I want to congratulate you and uh, the Kingdom of Jordan on the active role, on not giving up at the time of uh, great temptation to give up uh, the last few months on the Palestine-Israel uh, negotiations. And you have alluded to, uh, to uh, return back to some form of a dialogue. Uh, a lot of people are convinced in this town that nothing much is going to happen in a serious way, a strategic way, till the election in November here, this election. Uh, what I seem to have understood you to say is that there may be something going on. Could you give us a glimpse into the future of at least those negotiations? If I hinted that there's something going on, that means I you know, don't want to elaborate too much, but... No, um, th there's, there's, there's nothing of, of earth-shattering importance that's taking place behind the scenes, except attempts to try and bring everybody back to, uh, to a discussion. I can't call it direct negotiations at this stage. You know the parameters that were set by each side for direct negotiations. Uh, but the effort continues. I mean, what, what you don't see in public does not mean that there's not something happening behind the scenes in terms of effort. And there isn't. I mean, I'm speaking to everybody every day. Uh, to try and get them all um, uh, together. Let me, I mean, just go back to the, um, to the milestone that you said, and very, very correctly, which is the U.S. election. I mean, in, a couple of months ago, we were talking about the, the, the U.S. election and the possibility of an early Israeli election. Um, and then, you know, Prime Minister Netanyahu completely um, um, circumvented that by, um, by, you know, creating this broad uh, coalition that is unprecedented in Israel's history. He is now probably the most powerful, if not the most powerful, um, <laughs> um, prime minister in the history of Israel with the broadest coalition. And um, he is, is able to do things. Um, he is able and he is enabled uh, to, uh, to do things. He has the mandate. And I'm, and I'm hoping, and we're all hoping, that, um, uh, that uh, the government of Israel, led by Prime Minister Netanyahu, will realize that um, Israel's ultimate security um, will come through peace. Um, and nothing else. And I'm hoping that uh, the two sides, the Palestinians and the Israelis, will, will go back to the table. Um, we were involved behind the scenes with the preparation for the atmosphere of the letters. Um, Ab Abbas's letter to Netanyahu, Netanyahu's letter to Abbas, and I think to a certain modest degree we were um, um, able to influence um, the fact that the atmosphere was positive. 
by that I mean that the letters may not have produced much, but the, it could have been, um, it could have had ugly results. Had there been, you know, an exchange of fiery letters, we could have had ugly results. There's, of course, always the concern um, over settlement building and unilateral uh, action. And these recent announcements are just not only damaging, uh, but extremely harmful to the, um, uh, to, uh, to the process. You can't continue building new facts on the ground. I mean, I know we keep saying it while it goes on, but we have to say it and we have to condemn it and we have to say that this is illegal and cannot continue. And that's why our position for the last two years has been one of expediting and fast-tracking discussions on borders and security so that you can get rid of this issue of settlements that lingers and sometimes obstructs uh, negotiations every single time. Once you define the border, even if it's virtual at this stage, but once you define a line that is going to be the border, the border between the would-be state of Palestine and the state of Israel, then I think the whole world can act as a watchdog um, and say, well, you can't build beyond this line. That's, you know, that's a virtual line that has been agreed on. A discussion, a, a, a speeded up discussion on borders and security is very, very important. We maintain that, if you remember the, in the, our discussion two years ago when we were here in, uh, in Washington, it, it didn't happen. And we were extremely hopeful that when the quartet statement um, came out in September 2011, with the timeline that it had set, um, it would herald a, a something on the ground. Unfortunately, it hasn't happened, but there's still hope. It hasn't been lost um, um, altogether. My, uh, I'm sorry for the long-winded answer, but uh, the short summary of it is uh, there's a lot of diplomatic, a flurry of diplomatic activity uh, behind uh, the scenes, directly, indirectly, just trying to get that positive atmosphere to continue because there was a positive atmosphere after the Amman exploratory talks, after the exchange of, uh, of letters. And I hope, I hope that this atmosphere is not poisoned by these settlement um, announcements or expansions um, or by anything else. Um, it is important that the mood is maintained, that momentum is maintained. You don't want to get to the U.S. elections without something in motion. Um, without something substantive in, in motion. You don't want to reinvent the wheel after the U.S. elections. You just want to make sure that the wheel is rolling before and, and after. To, to follow up on this, how would you characterize uh, Jordan's relations with Israel today? Well, um, as in cool, warm, or lukewarm? Or the ambassador, <laughs> no ambassador, correct? Uh, but an embassy. An ambassador, right, correct. Yeah, I mean, I mean sometimes people... Um, people come to me and say, well, you know, you, when are you sending back the, the ambassador to Israel? You know, I have four or five capitals in the world uh, that have not had um, an ambassador for over a year now. None of them have complained to me. Um, <laughs> but we have a functioning embassy. I mean, I don't understand. It's, it's a symbolic thing, I agree, the presence of the ambassador. Uh, but, uh, I mean, I, I haven't had an ambassador in Turkey for a year. Um, and it's just procedural, completely procedural. I'm an ambassador... We'll, we'll go eventually. Um, but um, I know the symbolism that you're referring to, but we have a functioning embassy. I mean, every day there is contact between our diplomatic mission in Tel Aviv and various um, Israeli authorities, ministries. Um, and at the same time, um, I think that uh, really what we're, uh, what we're all looking for is a positive atmosphere, development um, in the peace process, and no more settlement building. No, it's, You know what I mean. We have, uh, go ahead in the back. Hello, thank you. Uh, my question is regarding the Jordanian Independent Election Commission. Uh, what, in your opinion, is the greatest challenge that the commission is going to face, and do you think that the commission is well positioned for the, the elections later this year? Um, one of the biggest challenges that uh, the IEC uh, faces is that it's a new setup. Um, first time ever in the, in the history of elections in Jordan that you have an independent commission, like I said earlier, totally independent from the executive, the legislative, and the judiciary. judiciary. Um, so the biggest challenge is going to be in six short months or whatever uh, date, I mean, I don't want to preempt the commission itself because it is the one that sets the date for election, but we're assuming since the king is always saying before the end of this year that it's going to be within the next six months. So one of the biggest challenges is how can it, within six short months, um, devise mechanisms uh, to run a fair and transparent and free um, election while 
not entirely relying on existing structures. I mean, for many, many years, uh, elections were held by the Ministry of Interior, by organs you know, under the Ministry of Interior. And this IAC has to either invent or create um, or, or be very creative uh, about um, uh, setting up um, a, an entirely new structure. That it's, it's a massive exercise. They're probably going to have to hire you know, tens of thousands of people to, to help them, I mean, who in the past were hired by the Ministry of Interior. So my, my thing would be, um, in answer to your question, the biggest challenge is how to rely on existing structures as minimally as possible um, in order to um, run a fair and free um, election, and in such a short time. That's number one. Number two, I would say that um, we've, had, we've had problems with elections in, in, in Jordan, I mean, in the last two or three elections. And some of the procedures surrounding the elections are criti criticized by, even by the king himself. Um, usually, you know, when the election takes place, and, and, and we see that, you know, it's either not an entirely representative parliament or some of the procedures had certain flaws and all that, and usually, you know, the king is, is the biggest critic um, of anything that goes wrong. I mean, he, he does not mince his words. So how is this election commission, independent election commission, going to produce an election that will be subject to, um, to scrutiny? And it's up to them. I don't know if they're going to be inviting international observers or regional or domestic observers or whatever. But this election is going to be subjected to much scrutiny. And how do you f conduct an election that is really um, beyond, beyond criticism um, in the future? Because that's going to be a big test for Jordan. So I think they have serious challenge, and not to mention, of course, the electoral law itself. It's being debated in Parliament now, and I think some of the procedures will come out of that, uh, of that law, and the IEC will have to deal with it. They're, they have a serious set of challenges. I, I'm pretty sure that they're well positioned to deal with these challenges. I'm, six months is a short time, five months is a short time, but it's not, uh, it's not, um, uh, un, it's not uh, impossible to do what they have to do. Well, we have one up here. Mr. Minister, I'm Jim Sievers from Georgetown University. Uh, it's always a pleasure to uh, see you back in Washington. Um, a fellow Hoya. <laughs> you had uh, mentioned the, uh, the key role of uh, higher education in the uh, developments uh, in the last 18 months. Um, I just wonder, looking forward, uh, what you see the role of higher education, if there are more reforms, if there are more developments that uh, you see going forward. Uh, if I understood your um, your question um, uh, correctly, I mean, how are we going to basically utilize the the outcome of higher education in uh, in, in society? But I would tell you that I, I don't know if um, if I made my point clear in my intervention, but we had invested in education many years many years ago, way way before anybody else did in the in the region, and we had to. I mean, in the fifties when um, when people were saying, you know, Jordan doesn't make sense. Um, no natural resources. It just lost uh, um, a, a huge uh, war. Um, um, or the, I mean, the Arabs had lost. Uh, and Jordan didn't in 1948. But <laughs> uh, <laughs> 1967 was a different story. But um, at that time, it was decided that Jordan would invest in education. And our biggest capital is the human capital. So we decided to invest in that. And today, I think you have the highest ratio in the world, highest university uh, ratio of university graduates to the rest of the population. We're always competing with Sweden. I think they're usually number two and we're number one or vice versa. Um, six and a half million people in Jordan today with about 30 universities. Um, so the investment is there. At times, it, it, um, it was counterproductive because, I mean, I remember in the 70s and, and 80s, we had you know, an oversaturated market when it came to engineers and doctors. Um, and and in, in, the, in the 90s, um, I, I think we had too many engineers. And in the, it's, it's fine. And it, that helped us also to export uh, uh, talent. Um, Jordanians um, who have gone to uh, our brothers and sisters in the Gulf and, and, and helped them and created the, helped create infrastructure, um, um, institutions, 
was, was good for us because we also rely on the remittances that come back from, uh, from these Jordanian expatriates. And they're you know, a solid backbone to our economy. But um, the most important thing in this day and age, in the context of the Arab awakenings, I would say that uh, you educate people and you have to empower them. You educate people and you have to provide them with job opportunities. You educate um, uh, people and you have to um, uh, respect their intelligence and respect uh, the work that you have, um, uh, that you have provided um, uh, for them and, and allow them to not only express their, their opinions freely but to take part in the shaping of their future. I mean, that's what I would say. Mr. Minister, can I, can I follow up? I mean, it's a very good question. I mean, you, we're all familiar with the work pioneered by Ali Mahalik. Maybe. And uh, the issue, of course, is the quantity of education, which is what you're discussing, the availability of education. You have now a proliferation of private universities in Jordan that are trying to sop up the demand for higher education versus the quality of education. And, and the gap that's been identified of educating students to be able to take the jobs that, that, that are needed. And to what extent is there a reform in, in that area, there in is. addressing the, the quality issue and sort of keeping more oversight of the proliferation of private universities that for some people are just money makers? Um, I don't know if that is restricted to Jordan only. No, it's uh, a regional. Yeah. It's, it's, a regional a, well, it's an phenomenon. international thing. Um, it's, an international it's an international thing. It's not true. just a, You're right. Yeah. Here, too, it's a big yeah. issue. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but I would, uh, I would say, uh, first of all, education reform is, um, uh, is, is very much on the way I mean, in, uh, in Jordan. We're looking at, uh, um, we're looking at uh, reform. I don't know if I would call it a proliferation of private universities. I mean, you, no. sound, you make it sound like a nuclear fire. But, um, <laughs> the demand is high. Yeah, um, I, I, I think we, we, we are you know, fully, fully aware of, uh, of the potential problem, uh, which is twofold in my opinion. Number one. Um, how do you ensure that the, that the product of your higher education is one that um, that meets the demands of the market um, and um, and uh, and the domestic scene? And two, how do you make how do you make sure that the, the quality that you're producing is the quality required? I mean, I I don't know if I would agree if that's what you were hinting at. If I would agree that by and large, and the quality the quality seems to be the victim there. Um, I, I think that Jordanian university graduates are not only um, well sought after in, in different uh, uh, countries, but when it comes to ICT in particular, um, I, I think you know, that's some of the best talent in the in the whole region. I mean, it's an issue. Yeah, it, yeah. It, I mean, I mean it, it, there could be specific cases of that. I don't know if I would um, you put that. You uh, raised the issue of joblessness among graduates. Yeah. And so that that's the gap issue. It is. It is. Um, it is true, but it, it's not related to the quality of the education. I mean, it's uh, probably related to larger larger um, uh, picture policies. Mm -hmm. And you're absolutely right. We have to look at that. Um, uh, Career placement, for example, I mean, is something that, that is not um, very common in our part of the, of the world. We're starting now with university. I mean, identify you know, your, the potential for what it is that you're studying, and the, the potential availability of, uh, of jobs or um, uh, of opportunities. Uh, it, it's happening. It's slowly happening. But the quality, I think, of Jordanian education remains okay. probably among the best in, um, in, in the region. I say that uh, you know, with, with all objectivity. In the front. Thank you very much for an excellent presentation. Uh, I have uh, two questions, but they are interrelated. Uh, you said that the Kofi Annan plant is the only game in town. Uh, for now. <laughs> for now. Uh, I was wondering how long people are going to wait to, s to say if it failed or not. What did you hear from the Americans on this? I mean, when, uh, when would the uh, international community say we have to move to something else? The second question is concerning Russia. You said Russia has to be part of the, uh, of the uh, effort uh, to implement the political part of the plan, uh, which is basically the transition. Uh, so far, the Russians have been saying uh, they don't see any uh, transition for uh, you know, a, a, a Yemeni uh, uh, model or something like that. I understand that the king will see the president uh, of Russia uh, this month. Uh, I don't know if it's true. Our king is seeing who? The president of Russia, uh, Putin. Oh, yes. yes. Sorry. Uh, 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 president Putin is visiting Jordan. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, I was wondering if, because I think... Well, he has a region, too. I think he would be the first uh, leader, who will see, Arab leader, who will see uh, the uh, Putin, uh, actually since the beginning of the crisis in, Russia, in Syria. 
Uh, I wonder what kind of message you will have for, uh, with uh, him. Do you think you can convince the Russians to be on board in transition? Thank you. Okay. Um, regarding your first question, ma'am, um, I, I said very clearly that the Kofi Annan plan is the only game in town you know, right now. There, there's nothing else. I mean, apart from us all turning a blind eye and letting the events take uh, um, without any attempt to, to try and resolve them. How long uh, does that apply? I think we made it very, very clear in the last Arab League Foreign Minister's meeting and in the core group of ministers meeting in Istanbul recently that this mission should be timelined. Um, it, it cannot just be open, um, open-ended. I think we're looking at two milestone dates. I don't want to call them milestone, but you know, significant dates. Uh, number one would be uh, the Friends of the Syrian People meeting in Paris, which is expected in early July. Um, and number two would be the set date for the expire of the Kofi Annan mission, which is around the 19th of July or 20th of July, if I'm not mistaken. And will it be renewed? I think if there's enough traction on the ground uh, between now and, um, um, and then, um, then you know, it would make uh, every sense um, uh, for uh, a renewal of, uh, of the mission if the political dialogue has begun. If my three questions are the following. Um, I wish I could say, don't quote me on this, but um, <laughs> just, just between the hundred of us um, is, is n- number one, who speaks for the Syrian opposition? Um, and we have different factions of, of the... So, so who speaks for the Syrian opposition right now? All the Syrian opposition. Number two is who speaks for the regime in terms of the dialogue? Who's the interlocutor on the regime's part with the, with the, with the opposition? Number three is if they're going to talk, then where? <laughs> so... Um, because where is important. I, would, um, I, I think these questions need answers, and I think there are answers in the, um, um, in, in the making. And yes, second part of your question. We, um, uh, we're all engaging with the Russians. Um, uh, His Majesty the King saw former President Medvedev in, um, in Seoul, end of March, in Korea. Um, we were all attending the Nuclear Security Summit, and I um, received um, Foreign Minister Lavrov uh, and I went and visited him, and I will probably be seeing him, see him again in a, in a few days. Um, and you're absolutely right, President Putin is visiting the region and will be visiting Jordan at the end of the month. So when we say engaging the Russians, it's important that the Russians are, um, are, are part of this all-inclusive, uh, Russians and the Chinese, of course, all-inclusive um, um, effort. And uh, I believe that some of the statements of, the, of, of Russian officials have been to the effect that you know they don't mind um, different scenarios, including AM and like. Later. Although, yeah. yeah, although you know the the parameters and the specifics are um, are different. The most important thing is that you know this is a, a, a serious thing. Um, there is violence continuing. There's a, a process of systematic killing that's continuing, and there are massacres being uh, being committed. There's um, also an infiltration of, of terror um, um, into Syria, and, and we worry about that in the, uh, in the region. Uh, so um, that's why we need to have the component that has not been tackled yet in the Kofi Annan plan, which is the political component, the dialogue. It has to start. Otherwise, as Kofi Annan himself said, it is doomed to lack of implementation or absence of implementation, which takes us into another field. Um, okay, we'll do these last two questions, the one here and then one in the back. So. Thank you for your comments today. Um, you mentioned the unpredictability of Egyptian natural gas imports, and I was wondering if you... Uh, I'm sorry, come again? You yeah. mentioned the unpredictability of Egyptian natural gas imports, yep. and I was wondering if you see opportunity for Jordan in Israel's new natural gas clients. Um, the, the problem with the Egyptian gas is that the pipeline gets blown up. Every uh, it, it, it's, it's not a it's not a commercial uh, problem. Uh, the, the, the Fourteen times it was blown up in in, in two thousand and eleven, um, and I think two or three times in two thousand and twelve. So far, so good in the last few weeks. Um, <laughs> you know, touch wood. But um, look, I mean, we're following the news of uh, all these uh, new discoveries in the Mediterranean. Um, of Gaza, of Cyprus, of um, we're following with concern. And as you know, energy is uh, is a huge concern for us. I mentioned that, and I, I discussed it in uh, in detail. And I remind everybody again of the figure of 96% of our energy is imported 
Um, and it is a nightmare scenario when an Egyptian gas pipeline gets blown up and, and the, the flow is interrupted, or when the price of uh, uh, oil you know, rises uh, sharply. You know, we, believe me, we stay up at night, and, and we start wondering you know, how we're going to cover the shortfall. So, um, again, Israel, Israeli uh, gas, I mean, I don't know the details um, of that, where and how and all that, but I see that Israel is pursuing vigorously the exploration of gas off the Mediterranean. I hope that I mean, at one point we were all talking um, a few years ago about the need to um, get this uh, peace process underway so that we can really concentrate, start concentrating on regional cooperation, um, on not just on, on gas but on transport, on energy in general, um, on water in a, in a region where water is so scarce. I think it only makes sense that all the countries cooperate. And for many years we've been saying that Israel has got to resolve the Palestinian um, uh, issues uh, so that Israel can become part of the region, not just in the region. We have time for one more question. Yeah, sure. I think there's one in the back. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Foreign Minister. I actually was going to ask about the Israeli natural gas. Would you consider at any point purchasing the Israeli natural gas? Do you guys represent the company or what? <laughs> 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 no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, I, I really can't. I mean, that's hyper. Sir, I mean, I, I right now there's none of that, but um, but of course we, you know, at, as I hope that the political environment in our part of the world would 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 allow uh, for all of this to happen in the future. Well, thank you very much for joining us today, and it's, it's been a pleasure. Thank you all. Thank you very much.